Hello and welcome. I am Steve Clemens, Editor-at-Large of The Hill. Thanks for joining us today for our forum on modern credit systems, alternative data, and the American dream. We're going to be exploring financial inclusion and how innovation can address a lot of modern credit problems that don't get discussed enough. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsor, FICO, for its support of today's event. It's going to be a great set of conversations. Stay tuned. When we think about the typical American dream or owning a home, buying a car, starting a small business, these are all ideas that might come to mind. For many Americans who lack access to traditional credit, like I once did, these could remain forever out of reach. In recent years, economists and some members of Congress have suggested incorporating alternative data, like cell phone, utility, rent payments, into credit scores. These data lines are currently excluded from traditional credit scores, but could provide information on financial responsibility that could expand credit access, and ought to expand credit access. Let me just put my marker there. How can policymakers install guardrails to ensure alternative data is used responsibly and not harmfully? How can financial literacy and inclusion be prioritized? How can historically underserved communities and communities left out of the credit picture be brought in and be given fair credit access? We're going to be putting these questions and more in front of our fantastic speakers, but first a few housekeeping notes. You can tweet us at, at the Hill events and use the hashtag, hashtag the Hill credit. We're broadcasting live and we'll be taking your questions throughout the entire program. And as with any live stream, you could experience occasional trouble. Not our fault. Not this time. Uh, if you refresh the page, they tell me it will help you and hopefully fix all the problems. My first guest is Congressman Patrick McHenry from North Carolina. He's the ranking member on the House Financial Services Committee. Congressman McHenry, it's great to see you. You know, I've been wanting to kind of get off this topic of who certified whom in the Senate and begin talking about real problems hitting real Americans. Now, you know, you've been around the financial services services track a lot. And, you know, I want to make this real for Americans. I want, you know, the folks watching us today that we're not just talking about, you know, policies that far away. But as you think about the financial services challenges, as you think about credit scoring, what are the gaps that we have to address from your perspective? Well, first of all, we have to acknowledge that you have uh, an oligopoly. You have uh, three credit reporting agencies that really don't compete with one another. Uh, it seems they have a, a pretty well agreed upon track uh, by which they, they operate. So we have a lack of competition for the credit reporting agencies. That's number one. Number two, we have a limited set of data that is under law, uh, the favored data. We have to expand that set uh, so that you have traditional American uh, activities that are current in this marketplace. So think about this. Um, uh, cell phone bills, as a, a great example. Uh, paying your water bill. Things that tell me uh, a lot about your credit worthiness are actually not a part of most credit files. Um, and these are huge expenses for every American. I'm sorry, nearly every American. Uh, so we need to expand uh, that, that data set. Um, and then third and finally, what we don't need is uh, a government agency uh, stepping in uh, to be a fourth uh, credit reporting agency. What we need is, that, like I said, with point number one, which is more competition. We don't need a government bureau to approve every data source. What we need to do is, uh, is, is have a, a more enhanced competition. So we don't need a, a CFPB, for instance, to get into the credit reporting agency business. Now, are you worried about the direction of the CFPB right now? I know, um, you know, I'm, I'm now just following you on Twitter. I'm a brand new uh, follower of, of Congressman McHenry. But I think, you know, the, the, the question I have is, do you think it's trying to turn itself into that and that the leadership that has been announced is trying to uh, turn that uh, CFPB into a new credit reporting bureau? Yes, uh, that was uh, on the docket for Richard Cordray's CFPB. And that was the intention uh, before, uh, before, well, four years ago. And we see that with the president's uh, you know, uh, nominee and uh, for the CFPB, we see that it's really going back to the old days of what Elizabeth Warren dreamed the agency could be, which is uh, quite un unaccountable um, and doing things that should be done in the private sector. Well, let me ask you a question that came up. I did a background call with our final speaker of today's event, Susie Orman. I think I can disclose that. Susie raised an interesting issue, and I just don't know where, you know, what to think about that, that COVID-19 is such an extraordinary hit on all of us systemically that people through no fault of their own 
have a new economic fragility. You know, we've seen uh, eviction moratoriums. We've seen support for people in jobs on unemployment. That this period of time that we're in is anomalous because of this, this huge shock. Should we be making some adjustment in the way that we're looking at, at credit, go back to the time before this hit? Because, you know, I just wonder whether we've created this Darwinian situation where, you know, those that are totally well off, fine. But everybody who was, uh, you know, through no fault of their own was hit by the, I'm just wondering where, I, I have no idea where your head is in this or where the Democrats are in this, but, but you know, it, there's a point there to be made, I think. Oh, sure. There's something to be made for that. And I think what you'll see is if you have accurate uh, credit reports, then the allocation of credit can be accurately and appropriately done. So those that are allocating credit, those that are making lending decisions, I think we'll be able to do that. Um, I would also say that we have an unprecedented amount of government money going to individuals, hmm. uh, government debt uh, produced and money going directly to individuals. And so in some ways, uh, you have a group of Americans that are uh, better off economically though they are actually worse off in terms of their jobs and their their uh, individual income making rather than uh, governmental support. So there's a, a quite a bit of uh, noise out there, if you will, about um, uh, Americans' credit worthiness. Um, also, you have an uh, uh, unemployment rate that is not historically off the charts, but what you have is uh, segments of the economy that are dramatically worse off. Hmm. So if you work in hospitality, for instance, let's say you waited tables and you actually had, uh, for Americans, what is described as an upper middle class income stream because you're really good at what you did. Uh, and now you're on government assistance. Well, does that really speak to uh, your productivity as a human being, uh, your credit worthiness. But you also have those folks that are making uh, sound economic decisions about how they're paying. So uh, I don't think we need to erase credit reports is, is, is really my larger point here. We should, we should acknowledge the reality of these things and, um, and allow lenders to make uh, those discretionary choices about their relative credit worthiness. Congressman McHenry, you know, I disclose this to folks perhaps at my peril, but I usually am this week at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, high in the mountains, you know, talking about economic issues, social issues, and others. And usually this very night, in fact, right now as we, I speak to you, I'm at a dinner hosted by Dan Schulman of PayPal. And, uh, you know, he does it every, every uh, Davos, not this year, of course. But, but one of the things that PayPal did and put in place, which I find so interesting, is that they began to find ways to finance small businesses or micro businesses, people that wanted to go out and venture, not by going through credit scoring, but by looking at reputational models, looking at other ways to look at how they finance. And I would admit that's not a FICO score, but there are other ways to look at how to look at the solvency and the question of risk related to somebody. And they have remarkable success. They've made it, created a multi-billion dollar industry in financing and sort of outsmarted you know, many of the, the, the banks, I think, in this. And I'm just wondering whether or not, when you kind of look at this question of getting you know, a wider aperture that's credible and solvent in looking at credit worthiness, is there something there in the model of Dan Schulman, or do you have other ideas in mind of how to open that aperture on credit worthiness? Uh, for damn sure, I think it is a good idea, and for damn sure, we need more of it. Uh, that is how emphatic I am uh, about what you've laid out, what PayPal's done, what uh, uh, Square is doing, uh, and a number of small business lenders. What I'd like you to ask my Democrat colleagues and raise this is whether or not they think that that small business lending is appropriate. What, you, uh, what my Democrat colleagues proposed last Congress um, here in the House was to uh, take um, uh, individual um, uh, credit scoring decisions and apply it to small businesses. That would uh, eliminate the capacity of PayPal to, uh, to take that program that you described that is, uh, that is loaning a, a significant amount of money uh, to individual small businesses and having an aggregate positive impact on the economy. Um, it would eliminate their ability to use those enhanced models and those broader models uh, for small businesses and would take them back to a very basic 1970s mentality of, uh, of, of a FICO score to allocate those, uh, that credit. I think that's a huge mistake. 
I think we have more vibrant small business lending because we have more competition. I think we have more vibrant small business lending because we have a wider array of data that goes into it. And I think that should be uh, a more enhanced model for how we allow individuals uh, to get uh, uh, lending and uh, greater choices. Congressman, I want to go to a, a question from the audience in a moment, but, but, but another quick one. You know, and I'm very aware at this time of stress in the country. You know, there's uh, I- I- income inequality. There's, you know, difference in, ge- in geography. Um, we have serious um, racial divide and identity questions in the country. And if you look back at the legacy of decisions that this country has made on infrastructure or whatever, you know, we, we've had a divided society. A lot of that falls along race. And all, but a lot of it also falls around you know, the question of literacy. And I'm just wondering, you know, I know that there are no silver bullets in this conversation, but as you look at financial literacy and as you look at bringing in some of those communities that have been historically excluded uh, from financial inclusion, what would be on the top of your list? You know, look, I, you have a unity of effect, economic effect, between certain urban communities and certain rural communities. And uh, while you raise the question of race, let's actually get into the economic uh, question here, right. because that is a deeply meaningful question uh, that, that we should speak to. Uh, what we have is in, in rural communities, they're being left behind and urban communities, they're being left behind. We've seen that not just uh, over uh, the last four years or eight years, but over the last 30 years. Mm. Uh, some of this is uh, the effects of trade on um, certain communities across the country, largely in rural areas. Uh, some deals with uh, race and ethnicity, uh, and those are mainly in urban centers. Right. But what unifies uh, b- both those communities is uh, education, training, um, and economic opportunity. Uh, and we need to make sure that we're uh, raising the rest up. Uh, as uh, the rise of the rest is this Steve Case initiative to sure. uh, go to those communities and, and give them access to capital uh, so they can create the economic future that they, that they hope and dream for. We need to have more of that. We need to make sure that we're having investment capital poured into these communities like we did with uh, Opportunity Zones uh, through the Tax uh, tax Cuts and Jobs Act. I think there's right. uh, more work that needs to be done to keep, bring these financial products um, in, a, in an understandable way, uh, but to pour resources into those that have been left behind. Um, right. And uh, regardless of race, regardless of ethnicity, uh, but, but getting into the, the deep effects of those who have been left behind economically for sure. Thank you for mentioning that. We're going to go to our question, but I want to mention that I had uh, Senator Tim Scott on uh, two weeks ago talking about Opportunity Zones, also Steve Case, uh, J.D. Vance, others on, on Rise of the Rest. So thank you for mentioning those. Uh, we have uh, Nicholas. Nicholas, question? Thank you for taking my question. My name is Nicholas Anthony. I'm a monetary and financial economist here in Washington, D.C. I'm wondering, what in your eyes has been the largest barrier to incorporating alternative data into mainstream credit scores? Why have small startups, fintechs across the nation incorporated this data so successfully where others have not? Thanks, Nicholas. Congressman? No, that's the difference between small business and individuals. Uh, we have quite onerous, quite stringent regulations that at the time were very thoughtfully put in place in the 1970s, uh, but the models have been, uh, we've outgrown them in terms of our computing capacity and in terms of the range of data that we can access. So what you see is small business lending uh, that gets a pretty aggressive rate for the relative risk of that small business. Um, And what we need to do is bring those models into the individual uh, consumer credit scoring data models. Um, And right now, uh, the reason why you haven't seen that is because we have not updated the laws that gave the consumer credit reporting agencies these quite enhanced uh, position in society. Uh, that was a 1970s law that has Mm -hmm. not been touched in any meaningful way since. And it's high time we have reforms thoughtful bipartisan reforms so that we can use uh, greater data sources and have more aggressive pricing when it comes to consumer lending. Congressman McHenry, someday the Hill is going to give me an hour-long show when I can just talk about my obsession with the scaffolding of our economic policies. But I need a junkie. I need somebody that's so obsessed with this on the other side that it will work. So I'm going to invite you back when they let me do that. I, I really appreciate I'm, your time today. I would today. love to do it. 
I would love to do it. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to talk about these really weedy, very important issues. Uh, they're quite foundational to our economic system and we need to make sure that they're right so that good things can happen and more good things can happen in our society. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. And now, a mess now for a message from our sponsor, please welcome FICO CEO, Will Lansing in conversation with personal finance expert, Lynette Kalfani-Cox. Thank you, Steve. Hi, I'm Lynette Kalfani-Cox, the money coach. And thank you to The Hill for organizing today's event. Helping consumers to understand and improve their credit scores is something that I think about every day. And that's why I'm super excited to be here today to help kick off this event with my friend, Will Lansing, the CEO of FICO, the sponsor of today's event. This conversation is focused on alternative data. And that's a topic that FICO knows about perhaps more than any other organization out there. As many of you know, a FICO score serves as an independent, predictive, and reliable indicator of credit risk. Building on the FICO score, FICO is now leading with innovations to help expand inclusion via alternative data. So with that, Will, again, it's great to see you. I wanna kick things off with a question about access. Can you please tell the audience, what is FICO doing to help responsibly expand access to credit. Thanks, Lynette. You know, FICO has been at the center of credit scoring for a long time. And we think that we have a special, unique and responsible role in the system. Um, we're constantly looking for ways to score more people. And so uh, probably worth just spending a second on um, traditional FICO scores because um, it, it starts with uh, credit, credit payment data and if you're responsible in the way you use your credit card, you pay your bills on time, you don't overdraw your line, um, you don't ask for too much credit all at once. Those are the kinds of things that contribute to a higher uh, FICO score. And the thing is, some people don't have credit cards. And so they don't have the credit card payment uh, data, the payment history. And so the question is, how are we going to find these people and, and get them scored so that they can get credit too? So we're, we're very focused on that. Um, worth noting that we are an independent company. We don't hold consumer data. All that we do is focus on the analytics for predicting credit worthiness. Now, we know that a lot of people have goals and objectives that have a price tag attached to them, whether that's paying for college, you know, buying a new car, uh, perhaps getting a house. And of course, in order to do that, most of them have to get it financed and get a loan. And so somebody's gonna check their credit scores. So what is FICO doing to help people to understand their FICO scores and then to improve it if they need to do so? You know, it's very important for people to understand their FICO scores because it, it contributes to access to credit and, and also how much the credit costs. Um, so we've done a few things. One is we have, uh, for many years, we've had MyFICO, which is a service provided by FICO that provides your credit score and your credit report, as well as a lot of educational material around how to improve your FICO scores. We have a program called Open Access, and it's available to hundreds of millions of uh, consumers through their financial institution, credit unions, banks, and um, you know you can get your FICO score from them. And then uh, finally, we've introduced a program called Score a Better Future, and that is aimed at providing us a free credit score and a free credit report, as well as financial counseling on how to improve those things. So th those are the kinds of programs that we've engaged in to try to try to get the FICO score out there and, and sure. improve people's understanding of it. Let me drive home that point, Will, that you mentioned about the open access program uh, in particular there, because that's um, something that I think, frankly, a lot of people, um, a lot of consumers aren't particularly aware of so I'm going to encourage people to do that because I think it's a good deal. Um, but let's move on and talk about people who lack access or who at least don't have traditional uh, credit scores or credit files right now because they haven't had, say, a mortgage, a credit card, or an auto loan, things of that nature in the past. What is FICO doing to address the needs of the credit invisible population? Yeah, well, that's a that's a big uh, opportunity for all of us to get credit into the hands of people who were previously unscorable. Um, we're constantly focused on innovation around this, identifying alternative data sources that um, that, that can do the job. Um, you know, we need to make sure that um, you know we we responsibly test these sources and that they're widely available. 
Um, but, you know, we're very focused on that. And um, it has, uh, it, it shows great promise. I would say that there are a lot of people who don't have scores today uh, who are going to have access to scores in the future because they pay their telephone bills on time. Now, I know that one of the challenges is that a lot of the alternative data is not really found in people's uh, credit files, the, the files that are maintained, the data at, you know, say, Equifax, Experian, TransUnion. So how can alternative data actually increase financial inclusion? Well, so the idea behind using alternative data is uh, that there are other data sources that can demonstrate that a consumer is credit worthy. Uh, so for example, telco data or cable, cable payment data, you know, if consumers are behaving responsibly by paying their cable bills and their telephone bills on time, um, that, that should be reflected in our assessment of their credit worthiness. And so, um, so I know we have a new score called FICO score XD, which is, which incorporates both telco and cable payment data. And, um, and you know, that's, that's one way. Uh, we also have a new score called Ultra FICO, and that is um, that's built around your checking account. And so, if you maintain balances, if you've had it open for a long time, if you don't all overdraw frequently, I mean, people make mistakes, but if you don't overdraw frequently, um, those are all indicia of responsibility. And um, and so, those kinds of things really help. And and so, we're you know, those are two examples. Permission-based credit scoring, I guess, is the is the key words uh, there. Um, so it sounds like that there's definitely a lot of promise in terms of the use of alternative data, but how is it that FICO is going to ensure that the end result of using some of this alternative data and expanding uh, access and promoting inclusion, that it's actually a net benefit for consumers? Uh, very important, very important. So I would start by saying that all these alternative data sources um, produce uh, new and incremental scores. So they don't take down your FICO score. What they do is they give you opportunities to get a score where you otherwise couldn't have one. So it's, it's a net positive, it's a net add. And you know, for us at FICO, we're very focused on making sure that everything we do is compliant with the laws, with the regulations. There's, there's a lot of uh, regulation around making sure that we don't have discrimination in lending. We have the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, and so everything that we do is tested against um, this regulatory framework to make sure that it's that it works, that it's, you know, and it's fair. And that's I think if you took away one thing from from this entire talk, it's we're focused on the science and the fairness. We, we want them both. and We want them together. We want to score as many people as possible, but leveraging those two things. OK, and my last question, Will, is what do you see as the future of credit scoring? and the ways in which the credit scoring system is going to become more inclusive? Well, I, I think that for sure, we're gonna be using a lot more alternative data. I mean, it's getting easier to access and, um, and we can put it to work in some of these new scores. So things like FICO score XD, leveraging the telco and cable data, absolutely we'll be using that. And, and frankly, uh, one of the things that FICO is doing is we're making FICO score XD available with no fees to uh, any lender that wants to use it for the next year. We, we would love to see more use of the score. I think the population of uh, people who are uh, you know, credit invisible right now is somewhere around 50 million people. So big opportunity there to make an impact. Um, so Will, again, thank you for your comments and insights. Great to hear about the innovations and what FICO is doing. So with that said, thank you all for watching. Thank you again to The Hill for organizing today's event. And Steve, we'll pass it back to you. Lynette, thank you for that great conversation. And Will, thank you for supporting today's program. Now it's time for a panel of experts. Michael Neal is a senior research associate in the Housing Finance Policy Center at the Urban Institute, one of my favorite institutions in town. They are like data central on stuff. He's had, a previous, he's had previous roles at Fannie Mae and the National Association of Home Builders. Jeff Tucker is a senior economist at Zillow. We all know Zillow, where he studies the causes and consequences of changing supply in the housing market. And Chi Chi Wu is a staff attorney at the National Consumer Law Center, where she focuses 
on consumer credit issues. She's the author of the legal manual, Fair Credit Reporting, and is a contributing author to Consumer Credit Regulation and Truth in Letting. Uh, Gigi, let me start with you. Uh, again, we're trying to get today, you know, look at this question of the reality of credit invisible people. People have been excluded. And let me just tell you, there's another dimension that's uncomfortable, you know, one of those uncomfortable conversations. People that aren't in, in, inside the, the, the sandbox of financial inclusion, th in my opinion, they're preyed upon. Everything is more expensive. Everything is more complicated. There's, you know, a, a set of social ills uh, that comes with that. So I'm interested in what you think we need to do to particularly address those communities that have been uh, excluded uh, from, the, from the financial scene. Well, first of all, um, the first thing I want to mention is my mantra or consumers advocates mantra about alternative data, which is the devil is in the details. It is really important when you're talking about alternative data and trying to help credit invisibles that you mm -hmm. do it right, that you mm -hmm. don't do it in a way so that they are not preyed upon. Right. Um, the, you know, there's some data that's shown a lot of promise, for example, the analysis of cash flow in people's bank accounts, credits and debits and balances has, mm. has shown some promise. Um, usually pre-pandemic, we've said rent payments have shown promise. Mm. But as we all know, people are struggling right now to pay rent. So maybe not so much right now. Flip side, there's some, kind of, some kinds of alternative data that are really risky for consumers. Mm. One of those is alternative data about high cost loans, payday loans, auto title loans, high cost installment loans. And, you know, talk about predatory, talk about, um, you know, things that cost too much. Um, and the irony is, you, you know, when there are proponents saying, well, we should use um, high cost lending to help credit invisibles, most of those folks aren't credit invisible. Mm. They're actually folks, unfortunately, with poor credit scores, low credit scores. And so you always have to remember that it's not just credit and visibility that you worry about. It's the folks who are struggling and who have low scores where things like credit and insurance cost more. And so I, you have to look at it holistically that way. I, I appreciate your perspective, you know, and, and you know, Michael, um, I happen to know a ton of your colleagues over at Urban Institute. I'm a big client and consumer of Urban Institute data. You know, one of the things that motivated me about today's program is, you know, if I'm reading the data right, um, there are about 25 million Americans who otherwise would be qualified who have no credit bureau file, 28 million uh, who have a credit bureau file but not sufficient for scoring. So 53 million people, it's a big chunk of folks who are outside. And then that, that's before you get it, I think, some of the other dimensions uh, that Chi Chi just laid out. So I guess my question to you is you look at this question, right, of economic activity, and one of the reasons why I was very interested today is to the degree that you can get credit where credit should be done, that you get the biases removed, that you get greater pictures that, that, that create a different uh, set of tracks, not to do things inappropriately, but basically there is an inappropriateness in not opening up that aperture. How do you see it um, with your colleagues at Urban Institute? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. You know, look, and, and let me start off by saying that, you know, I think it's important to distinguish between the, the, the cyclical conditions under which credit scores perform um, and the structural ones. Right. Um, that is, you know, under cyclical conditions, I think exactly to what Chi Chi said, that in, in times of recession, you know, there are going to be a, a portion of people that are going to be, that, that, that are going to operate worse off. Um, they're going to lose their jobs. We know the unemployment rate is going to rise. We know that some people are going to lose their jobs uh, uh, by definition, um, and, and they're not going to have the income uh, to, to, to make their payments and to meet their credit uh, obligations. And that's going to have an impact um, ultimately on their credit score. Um, but at the same time, I think what we really want to get at here is the underlying structural issue. Um, and the structural issue, I think, um, is, is, is most shown, particularly when we look at a lot of the issues across race. Um, one of the things when we think about expanding credit access that we saw, um, particularly after the Great Recession, um, was that uh, credit availability, uh, particularly for, to, in order to buy a home, um, actually remained quite tight, um, in mm. large part because credit scores remained elevated relative to where they were uh, prior to the Great Recession. Huh. Um, the longer that that continued, the less of, uh, I think the less 
less intuitive it was that it was that that that, that there was a cyclical component to that that was driving that, and that it was more being driven by a lot of the structural issues that um, that even predated of uh, uh, the Great Recession. I see. I say all that to say the reason I say all that is because I think there are two parts that your question brings up. The first one is to what degree are we do do, do we need to expand access to credit, um, but also to what degree is it the way that we measure credit, uh, uh, someone's some, someone's credit uh, 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 ability, their ability to repay credit. To what degree do we need to somehow alter that? Um, and the reason I think that both of those are important is because our data shows that we, we wrote a report in 2018 showing that roughly about a third of African Americans um, did not have a credit score. That matters because we know that house prices were rising right. at the same time, uh, increasing and expanding uh, housing equity. So these were a number right. of people who were not able to access credit, who may not have been able to get to access home ownership. There might have been other reasons at play that I want to touch on maybe a little bit later, hopefully, but they were not able to access home ownership and thereby it may have contributed to the widening of the wealth gap. Well, that's why we got Jeff Tucker here of, of Zillow. Thank you for that, Michael. Jeff, um, you're in the housing world, but let me just ask you, you know, a question I don't know the answer to this. I mean, it, it, Zillow really operates by algorithms, and, and you're not a credit score, but you basically value lots of participants in the economy around the housing and rental market. It's, you know, very impressive at one level, but, but those algorithms and what goes into those algorithms matter. And so let me just ask you the question, what, how should those algorithms be shifted, do you think, to to create a fairer, uh, you know, set of ex, you know expanded credit if that's what's deserved? How would how would you shift things? How would you shift your own algorithms? Yeah, I, I love Chi Chi's phrasing that the devil is in the details. Um, when you have a giant black box algorithm, you know, we use machine learning and artificial intelligence to train an algorithm like the Zestimate. That's sort of our claim to fame, right? Is estimating the value of every home in the country. Uh, we are well aware of the risks that an algorithm like that can essentially take in data from a biased system and then recreate it and help potentially, if you're not careful, further entrench that. And I think when it comes to credit scoring, if we're starting to take information, you know, especially if we're thinking about younger folks, people in their 20s, we're trying to get them into the credit reporting system sooner rather than later, what we may end up doing is actually getting a clear picture of how wealthy their parents are, really. You know, mm. if you have mom and dad able to chip in at the last minute to help you pay this bill or that bill, that's actually going to not really reflect your credit worthiness, it's, but it's just sort of recreating the credit worthiness of your parents, which could sort of flow into some of that early life cycle data. And, you know, I, I really appreciated Michael's point about the, the way that this housing boom, and we just saw a tremendous home price appreciation boom in 2020 has been a much less inclusive housing boom than in the 1990s or early 2000s. This was a boom predicated on actually excluding a lot of people from home ownership. We saw prices rising as home ownership rates fell or remained really low, especially for black and Hispanic borrowers. Um, so that's the, the risk there is that you can actually, similar to credit reporting, you can kind of entrench these differences in outcomes further ahead in time. We, we looked back at the redlining maps. We took digitized redlining maps from the 1930s, overlaid them on this estimate, just looked at average estimate in the declining versus the best areas. Hmm. There's a gap of about $300,000, or it's more than double the price still 80, 90 years later in those, in those green lined areas, basically compared to redlined areas. And that, that just reflects the way that these kind of generational inequities can get carried forward into the next generation. Well, thank you for that. You know, I'm fascinated by the um, uh, Zillow. We'll have to have you back to a show on Zill, uh, Zillow algorithms and what goes in. I've been wrestling with them. But, but Chi-Chi, let me um, you know, come back to the devils in the details. If you were to be in charge of expanding the inflow of data and what's read, you know, some of the ideas right now that are being discussed today are things like rent, utility, cell phone payments. But how would you expand it? What would be the other dimensions that you would include, uh, you know, in what you would consider a fairer and better um, credit scoring picture? So um, thank you for that question. And I, I think I am what I'm going to do is is uh, talk about and push back a little bit of, um, from one of your previous speakers. Um, one of the ideas that I think is really exciting out there is the idea of a public credit registry. Hmm. Um, you know, it, it's kind of bizarre that credit reporting is a private function, if you think about it. Here are these three companies, this 
controls all this information about us that determines our access to credit and, and employment, rental, housing, and insurance too, mm -hmm. um, because that's what credit reports and credit scores are used for. And it's in the ha hands of these three private companies that don't compete with each other. And their highest duty is to make money for shareholders, not the mm -hmm. public good, not the American economy. So um, this group Demos and um, our organization have supported the idea of having a public credit registry or public option at least that would have as its mission protecting, uh, helping consumers, the economy, the credit economy. And, and so that is one idea to expand the box. You know, in terms of, um, you know, the kinds of data we've said, cash flow is promising, rental data, has been promising, although right now we have a lot of struggling renters. Right. Um, gas and electric utilities we're very concerned about, and that is because um, those are sort of special payment obligations. They are natural monopolies. There's a lot of consumer protections that get undermined. And the way you do it is important too. If you take a lot of new data and you dump it into the credit bureau files, what you're going to do is you're going to end up hurting people who already have a credit file. Hmm. Um, you could possibly hurt people with already with a credit file and with a credit score if they're having trouble paying their utilities, for example. What you want to do is use that data as an alternative or a second chance or a waterfall score. And in fact, you know, again, the congressman mentioned an oligopoly. Why would you take this alternative data and give it to the credit bureaus, which are the very entities that compose that oligopoly? You want a, if you want competition, you want new sources of information and new companies that manage and right. manage that data, right? You don't, you don't want to give it to the same old companies that are the problem to begin with. And so that's, again, that's part of mm -hmm. the devil in data, not only what kind of information, but how you use it. Michael, what kind of apertures would you open up? What do you think would be uh, useful? And, and again, how do you feel about opening up on rent? So, and let me just add one other dimension because again, uh, Susie Orman raised it, you know, that, that is there a way to begin looking? A lot of people live not on credit cards, but on debit cards. But debit cards is also financial behavior, financial footprint. You can measure, you know, uh, I suppose, I hate to use these words, but financial responsibility. I, w I agree with Chi Chi that, that the COVID era is a weird, uh, uh, anomalous, anomalous era should be, be you know, uh, accounted for in that. In that. But, but what areas would you open up that you think would create a sounder and more inclusive um, uh, credit uh, space? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, again, excellent question. And, you know, let, let me start off by saying that I, I think, you know, part, part, part of what we're part, part of what we what I think we believe is that there is still room um, to expand credit access. Um, without necessarily expanding the risk that's associated with with credit lending. Hmm. Um, and from and so from that standpoint, um, a uh, uh, from that standpoint, I do think that from a structural perspective, there are certainly payments um, that are made consistently over time uh, as part of your living um, that can somehow be that that can somehow be included. Um, that to a degree right now are only included um, if you make uh, if 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 something that if if an adverse event occurs. So, for example, if you're paying your uh, your, your your mobile payment, uh, you forget to make your payment, an inquiry comes. Um, that inquiry will find its way onto your credit report, but it won't find its way on your credit report as you're making your mobile payment each each and every month. Um, and so, somehow, the degree to which uh, to which those kinds of payments can be included in the way that we that in in, in the credit box uh, 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 algorithm or assessment, um, I think, can go some way. Um, toward uh, toward expanding credit access, um, but you know I think one of the key concerns here is certainly, and I think this was mentioned a little bit earlier, um, are certainly issues of privacy um, and how are we able to find that balance between privacy and some of the uh, some of the alternative data that might exist uh, outside of the traditional scope. Well, excellent. Um, Jeff, one of the things that has, has come up um, is the 2008-2009 financial crisis that at that time, when you look at, you know, the, the financial markets, credit default swaps, you know, subprime uh, mortgages and, you know, that whole arena, um, which I will call, you know, vast negligence in governance and, and to a certain degree, 
it, you know, in my book, this is Steve Clement saying this, you know, a bit of corruption, but, but people um, were able to jump in and get more credit at a time than perhaps they could handle. So it's the other side of the equation, which is how do you, I mean, I'm just sort of interested in how you get the equilibrium right between getting more people in the door so that they have more credit and opportunities and they're not excluded on any, uh, uh, you know, appropriate bias uh, or in, inappropriate bias. But you can also go the other way and begin creating hardships. And I, I still know people whose mortgages are underwater or who are still financially suffering from that economic crisis 12 years ago. So uh, I'm just interested in if, if you and your economist uh, colleagues at Zillow have talked about that dimension. I, I mean, you, you sort of hit the nail on the head. It's a balance that you need to strike of between availability of credit and the overextension of credit to people who are not in a position to pay it back. And we certainly saw excesses in lending in particularly 2004, 2005, even 2006. Um, those sort of chickens came home to roost in the crisis that, that really came to a head in fall 2008. We got the, the great financial, uh, sorry, the, the global financial crisis and the great recession. Um, but th th there's a wide array of possibilities for credit access, particularly in the mortgage market, between what we saw in 2004, 2005, and what we've seen for the last several years, which was the last several years have been have seen very strict underwriting standards. Um, we've seen the sort of apparently kind of minimum credit score just keep climbing higher. So the the, the credit score of borrowers in recent years is, is impressive, astronomically high. And what that suggests is that there, there's actually a pretty large segment of the population that's still being excluded from the possibility of home ownership. Um, another dimension there really has to do with uh, whether lenders are actually willing to uh, extend mortgages on small purchases or refinance small loans. Mm -hmm. So there's th a bit of this gap where for a lot of lenders, it's not even really worth it to get into the market with, you know, sixty, seventy thousand dollar mortgages in very, uh, un, you know, very underpriced or just low cost parts of cities, which actually makes it really hard for people who are often paying much more in rent than they would on a mortgage to get into home ownership and take on some of that chance to build equity. So I think there, there's, a, there's a lot of space between what we did in 2005, which we absolutely should not get back to doing, um, and what we could be, how we could still expand credit right. today. I mean, just continuing to do a good job verifying income, the security of your job, um, alternative assets to fall back on. If we just do that, uh, we're miles ahead of what a lot of lenders were doing in 2005. So if we start there and then think about just sort of inching this credit box outward a bit, uh, we can make a lot of progress on opening opportunities. I love this discussion because, you know, it's one where it's, you know, we're, we're you know, as the congressman said, we're very much in the weeds. At the same time, you know, I hear you know, we can get better algorithm, we can improve, we can get other communities included, and the devil's in the details. I mean, all of this sounds very constructive. We do have a, a question from our audience. Um, Amina? Hi, my name is Amina Zia. I am the founder of Blue Ridge Impact Consulting. We are a social impact firm uh, specializing in facilitating dialogue around impactful and sustainable outcomes with community stakeholders. So we would like the conversation to reflect on what role, if any, can local and state leadership, political leadership play in ensuring that there is a stakeholdership approach to developing a sustainable re response and recovery effort to ensure that we have financial inclusion. Thank you. Big question. Financial inclusion, stakeholders, how do we get it right? Chi-Chi? Um, thank you for that very thoughtful, very good question. Um, I'm a lawyer, so, you know, like hammer, hammer see nails, uh, I think about laws. And I think about the way that credit reporting, credit scoring has been used for exclusion and how local and state governments can address that. So very, one very important issue, for example, is that credit, a lot of folks don't realize credit reports are used for employment. About half of employers use credit reports. I mean, that's just bizarre, especially in this COVID era. If you think mm. about some poor consumer who lost their job because by luck of the draw, they happened to work in a restaurant versus Costco, they couldn't pay their bills and their credit report was damaged that report could exclude them from another job. And so yeah. state and local governments can address that issue and restrict the use of credit reporting. Um, it, they can provide protections to consumers. Now, it's, it's tricky because the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which is the federal law that governs um, 
credit reporting um, does override state law in some, but not all instances. Happy to talk to anybody about the, the very gory, weedy details of that. Um, but yeah, state and local governments have can have a role in protecting their consumers from um, the abuses and problems with credit reporting. I mean, just one bizarre example, there is a system in New York that is using um, Experian right. to verify identities for signing up for the vaccine which means that people who are credit invisible can't sign up to get the vaccine using that system. I mean, it's, it's, it's insane. So. I invite you to write an op-ed for The Hill on that, because that's something I had not heard uh, before. But listen, we, unfortunately, we've run out of time. But I want to say, you know, you call it laws. Um, uh, Michael calls it data. Uh, 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 Jeff calls it algorithms. I mean, this is the scaffolding of a really important discussion I'm very, very happy to have had it with all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Michael Neal, Senior Research Associate at the Urban Institute, Chi Chi Wu, Staff Attorney at the National Consumer Law Center, and Jeff Tucker, Senior Economist at Zillow. This was terrific. I hope you'll come back, as I'm not done with this conversation and all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. <clears throat> Thanks. John Hope Bryant is the founder, chairman, and CEO of Operation Hope. He's been named an American Banker Magazine Innovator of the Year, one of Time Magazine's 50 Leaders for the Future. And he's, he's advised the last three sitting presidents. We'll have to see if he gets into this new one, specifically in areas around financial inclusion and economic empowerment. John Hope Bryant, it has been years, my friend. It's very, very good to see you again. Uh, we, we have history uh, uh, from over decades. And so congratulations to you, I want to say personally, on all that you've achieved you know, to help open this door. But, but you know, as we talk today about bringing more people you know, in, in, into the financial sandbox, they've been, they've been excluded, left outside, you know, what are the most important dimensions of this to you right now? Oh, we've got you on mute, John. Yeah, first of okay, all, great. thank you for all you've done over the last couple of decades to bring light to this topic since the Rodney King riots of 1992, you and the Hill. Um, we are living in a moment in history right now. Uh, history doesn't feel historic when you're sitting in it. It just feels like another day, but that doesn't mean the moment is not in fact historic. And we um, are looking at social justice now through an economic lens, really. Hmm. Uh, you're going to achieve social justice through economic, an economic lens. Uh, if you looked at um, what's going on four years ago plus that happened in the ballot box, you know, that was a riot of frustration. You looked at what happened January 6th, a riot of frustration, a frustrated aspiration. You look at what happened with urban communities, the protesting, some rioting, which I don't endorse, by the way, a riot of frustration, um, that uh, these are voices of the unseen and the unheard, and we're speaking the language of money, really, but we're not talking about it. The color today is not black or white or red or blue, it's green, as in the U color of US currency. And there's just not enough of it to go around. And when we do distribute it, it's, uh, it's not an investment. I mean, we're not thinking through this properly. Um, by the way, 100% of all the in-neighborhood shootings uh, in the last five years, and George Floyd in particular, uh, by police officers of African-Americans, were in 500 credit score neighborhoods. Uh, it's a hundred percent of those neighborhoods and all of the problems that we're facing are in really sub 650 credit score neighborhoods. We see a check casher next to a payday loan lender, next to a rent to own store, next to a title lender, next to a liquor store and a church down the street trying to make you feel a little bit better about your problems. And the reality is that this is not an urban black and brown, an urban black and brown problem because what I just described to you is also happening in rural white America. So how do we solve this? We, we need to target 700 credit score neighborhoods. We need to have a goal of 700 credit score neighborhoods because 700 credit score neighborhoods don't riot. They go shopping. <laughs> they raise yeah. their family. They start right. businesses. I've never, so, quite heard it. I've never quite heard it that way. That's a very powerful way to do it. You know, I haven't seen the map that kind of looks at those credit scoring areas. But as we talk today, you know, FICO is supporting today, but as we talk about credit scoring, Good I think job. there are two dimensions to it, right? There's one, which I find very interesting, of, you know, promoting literacy so that people get an early understanding of what the tracks are to, uh, you know, a better credit saying that's one dimension. Another dimension is, okay, what's, what, what cards are stacked unfairly that need to be open? What are the other ways to read 
uh, people's credit profiles or what, what should be. So I just ask you, if you, if, you know, what would be the things that you would do? We're talking today about you know, rent, cell phone, other sort of payment behaviors that, that are out there. You know, do you think that's a good step forward? What would you add? Yes, uh, this is a radical movement of common sense. I talked to uh, uh, the CEO, Will, of uh, FICO recently. I believe that he's on the right track with what he's talking about. Uh, and by the way, you can map this entire country and its aspiration and opportunity and problems by credit score. The, the poorest state in America is the lowest state credit score state in America, which is Mississippi. And the, the, opposite, the opposite is also true. I would do alternative data, which you have mentioned on your program. Uh, copies of rent statements, phone bills, utility bills. These are, are, are ways in underserved neighborhoods hmm. of showing that you're credit worthy. If you're paying your 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 phone your, your mobile phone bill, that's a form of credit. You're paying auto insurance. This is an interesting one. You don't get a one bill from your auto insurance carrier where you pay most people one time a year. It's checked. It's put into monthly payments or quarterly payments. That is a effectively a term financing agreement. Uh, my guess is insurance companies are taking all this uh, these uh, premium payments. They're selling it off to a finance or they're securitizing it probably on Wall Street. Uh, and you're, you know, so you're part of a financing instrument. Well, shouldn't the average everyday human being with too much month at the end of their money, trying to get, who should get credit for everything they do, the average single parent household run by a woman needs a Nobel Peace Prize for running a family where she's living from paycheck to paycheck successfully. Shouldn't they get credit for that? Shouldn't they get credit for the auto loan, uh, the, I'm sorry, the auto loan insurance bill that they're paying or the home insurance bill that they're paying? These are some easy ones. Here's another one. We find out at Hope Inside that 95% of people who come to us, and by the way, 41% of all African Americans have a credit score below 620, which means that almost half of black folks are locked out of the free enterprise system, no matter how brilliant you are, because we didn't finish the work of the Freedmen's Bank of 1865, which was chartered by Lincoln to teach free slaves about, about money. But what we found at Hope Inside, when we coach and counsel people, is that 95% of folks have an error on their credit report. So if you're financially illiterate, it's what you don't know that you don't know. You're not checking your credit. You don't know there's an error. When we, the, they don't know the law states, you write a letter to the three credit bureaus. If they can't confirm that's yours, as you know, they must remove it. Well, that pops your credit score 30 points. So if you're, if you're 590, you're now hmm. 620. That puts you in the game. Change yeah. your whole life. Change your self-esteem, your confidence, your optionality. So I think massive financial literacy for all part of my new Marshall Plan. Uh, we need to have legis we have needed K through college education, financial literacy education uh, as a baseline. Financial right. coaching for adult families and innovations, many, many of the things you talked about today. Well, I, I, you know, I really love that package of, of, of things, John. You know, you and I have known each other a long time. I think part of the question is, you know, show and tell, you know, and how do you, you know, disrupt people's, you know, frame of, you know, they're, most of us run by inertia, right? But how do you wake them up? And I, and I, and I know you do that. I know that you're working, uh, John, on, on uh, uh, the One Million Black Business and Entrepreneur Initiative. Sounds so interesting to me. I should say on this show, For the Hill, uh, whether it was during you know, government shutdowns or whatever, I've always looked for people who scrambled and innovated and kind of ran. One of my favorite is furlough cheesecake. These two uh, happen to be black women who were you know, laid off in government, went out to create a business, and they tell their whole story of how hard it was to get money in the door, whatever. Now they're, they're, they're kind of literally booming. So there are good stories out there, but not everyone is good. I guess my question to you is, you know, with your entrepreneur initiative, what do you need? Where is it going? Yeah, so this is... Um uh, this really speaks to operationalizing financial literacy in the way in which you've been sort of asking that question during your whole program. How do we go from PhD to PhD too? Hmm. And what people need is a way to, uh, they need an aspirational opportunity to make financial literacy real. Otherwise, it'll, otherwise it'll put folks to sleep. Uh, uh, owning, buy, wanting to buy a home, small start a business. These things are what we're doing in bank branches to get the banks out of the no business and back into the yes business by coming to that point of, of um, decision making where the bank may have to turn somebody down and we step in, give them financial coaching, get the credit score up 54 points in six months, 120 points in 24 months. Nothing changes your life more than God or love than moving your credit score 120 <laughs> points to make them <laughs> approvable. And that pops GDP, makes the yeah. loans viable for the banks, pops GDP for the country. So likewise, now it's scaling this up. Shopify, the second largest e-commerce company in America, has decided that black businesses is good business and, and philanthropy and business should not be 
interconnect, uh, should not be separated. So they made a $130 million 10 year commitment uh, to, to create with us a million new black businesses in America. Uh, and 96% of all black businesses, as you know, because you're on your game, don't have an employee. Right. So you can't, we can, there's no wealth creation. There's no generational wealth. This is more busy, busyness mm. than business, mm. but they're smart, they're brilliant. So we give them financial coaching, financial counseling, financial literacy, credit score improvement work. Is, again, these are folks using their personal credit for the business enterprise, speaking to one of your uh, uh, points, one of your, your, the folks made earlier, which I think I modestly disagree with, their rationale, because the personal credit and the business credit in this case is the same thing. We then give them free license with, like, with uh, Shopify, free uh, donated, we actually invested, free website, free storefront, uh, free, free payment systems, free de uh, uh, delivery systems. These are investments in the business. And then what people can do watching this, if you're a lawyer, you're an accountant, uh, you're a CPA, you're an insurance rep, you're a banker, you wanna help, give us two hours per business. Donate that time, invest that time to help these businesses gird up the inside of their operations uh, because in two years, maybe that same business you're donating to will pay you for those services because they're successful like the one you just mentioned. And I think a million new black businesses in America is social justice in this country. John, that's, that's terrific. We have a, a question from our audience uh, from, from Portia. Portia? Hi, my name is Portia Jackson, and I am a realtor here in Los Angeles, California with Pacific Playa Realty. My question is, what is the first policy win to alleviate consumer debt or student loans that you think the Biden-Harris administration should focus on? Uh, I would, uh, I'm gonna cheat and give you two. Uh, living wage for all, uh, which, which is take the earned income tax credit, apply it to everybody who makes $60,000 a year or less, uh, uh, which cuts 80% of the, well, 65% of this country, uh, make it a requirement uh, you don't have to go request it. It is embedded now. The government just sends you a bonus for working as Wall Street gets it, Main Street would get it. It would be paid for not by businesses. It would pay for by all Americans, which would make it an incremental cost. You wouldn't even feel it from the average American. It would raise average uh, living wage up. It would create more GDP. You'd embed that with financial literacy for all. So now you have effectively a twofer. You got financial literacy, financial coaching, and a living wage which raises the economic energy for everybody and reduces the tension, which is unfortunately uh, affecting public policy making uh, and, the, and the state of energy in this country and hopefulness for all, as I said earlier. Uh, also, Portia, I want to mention, uh, you know, not to, to support the Biden team, but just to say that President Biden last week, because I, I was on the call, uh, has moved to suspend principal and interest payments on student loan debt until March 31st, and hopefully to encourage the cancellation for every holder of a student loan up to $10,000 in principal uh, by September 30th. So it's just something to, to keep in mind that there's a little bit of uh, financial wiggle room there. Um, but John, let me ask you, you know, uh, later in our program, we have Susie Orman coming here. I, had, I, I benefit from an early call with her and it's, you know, stuff rolling around my head. She's very, very <laughs> animated in this. And, and one of the things she says is there, you know, people, uh, certain communities deal in cash. Like we're missing, you know, I, I think what's interesting about today is we're talking about rent payments. How do we capture, you know, the specificity of people's financial behavior, financial footprint through other means and widen the aperture? But is there some way to do that in the cash world, in the debit world and looking at people's, you know, um, side there that we ought to be looking at? Well, you've got to incentivize people to want to get into the, the to the mainstream economy. I right. mean, let, uh, I, I remind folks who want to demonize drug dealers that NASCAR was created out of moonshine running, <laughs> which was a cash <laughs> business. <laughs> uh, they realized they couldn't keep running from the police. Uh, they had to do something legal. Well, a drug dealer is essentially an illegal and ethical entrepreneur. Uh, but they understand import, export, finance, marketing, wholesale, retail, uh, well, customer service, Security, territory, logistics. These are, you know, they have a horrible business plan. It's morally unacceptable, but they're not dumb. And you think about it in all these communities across this country versus just accepting things as a status quo. You say, how many, un, how much untapped GDP is there in these, in the drug dealers who are illegal entrepreneurs and the gang organizers who are frustrated union organizers? Okay, what have we got them in? What have we, we went in and trained them up, going back to financial coaching, financial literacy for all, hope business of box, training for these folks so they have natural small business skills. 
And, and, and what we do is whole business of box academies where we, for kids, we give you, we'll invest $500 if you pitch your business idea and agree to open a bank account. Mm. So this is now answering your question. Nobody just, nobody wakes up and says, ooh, let me open a bank account. <laughs> ooh, I want a mortgage. <laughs> ooh, I want to pay the tax man. You, you've got to give people a reason uh, for the season. And I think by giving them that $500 chance to show their skills, this is K through, K through high school example, they right. pitch their idea, they get that, that, that commitment, but the money has to go into an FDIC-insured bank account, uh, and you got to get a business mentor, and you have the books and records, you have to have an, uh, 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 the accounting records. So now you're, you're incentivizing people. I mean, look, you know this. Life's about rewards and penalties. So we had to incentivize people to, to mainstream. This is the American story we're talking about. We really need a new Marshall Plan, which is what I wrote early last year, and the Biden administration is considering now, right now, at scale, over 10 years. Besides what you just told me, which sounds very compelling, if you were sitting down with Joe Biden instead of Steve Clemens right now, what would you tell him? Uh, I would tell him to listen to Steve Clemens. <laughs> uh, I mean, look, I, the administration, to their, to, to their credit, I don't want to get ahead of them, they have reached out to me several times during the transition and even as recently as last night. Um, I think you're going to find a really moderate, inclusive. I think you're going to find more some, something that looks more fuchsia than more red or blue or blue or red. I think you're going to find that this is a legacy move for the president because I don't think he wants a second term. I think he wants to make America uh, normal again in, in one term with GDP growth and an economy that works for all and dignity return for everybody. Uh, and that's going to be that, that's going to have to be inclusive. So I think I would say that we got to find ways to bring everybody along. I think financial literacy for all is an easy win. Legislation that makes financial literacy a requirement K through college is an easy win for everybody. I think a living wage for all is easy. I think here's one, internships and apprenticeships at scale. Give corporations where 90% of all jobs come from a tax benefit to bring on millions of young people and give them a reason to, to graduate from high school, go to college if you like, but that's not a requirement, to get an internship into uh, corporate America, community, faith, or government, giving them the, the let's repair the ladder. That, that's what I would say. Uh, it, it's, it's not complicated, but it has to be a 10 year commitment. It has to be scaled and it has to be about free enterprise working for all of God's children. But I think he knows most of this already. <laughs> well, John Hope Bryant, uh, founder and chairman and CEO of Operation Hope, good friend. I, I've always said, you know, you are I, uh, part of what makes me uncomfortable in this conversation is that all your provocations make so much common sense. I mean, I think that's the, the you know, interesting moment. It's just common sense. Uh, why don't we do it? So I hope we do. And thank you so much for joining us today, John. Honor. God bless you. Thanks for what you do. Congresswoman Joyce Beatty from Ohio joins us next. She serves on the House Financial Services Committee, where she serves as the chair of the Subcommittee on Diversity and Inclusion. We've had the pleasure of talking to her many times here at the Hill. In December 2020, she was elected chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. Congresswoman Beatty, great to see you again. Uh, we're at it again. We're at it talking about how can we make this country better? How do we get people in the door? What are the right ways to do it? What are the wrong ways to do it? So as we think about financial and conclusion, you know, it's the story of the economy is also one of race. It's also one of bias. It's also one of how do we fix it? So I guess I would just start out with what's on top of your list as we talk about potentially opening up the apertures so we get a different way to get more people in the door. Are we doing enough? What would be on your list? Well, first of all, let me just say thank you so much. And we certainly have a list. Whether I am answering it as chairwoman of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, which we're making great headway, with or as the newly elected chairwoman of the Congressional Black Caucus. Today is a good day that we just learned that President Biden has introduced his racial justice and equity forum that he's going to put throughout all of his cabinets. That's very much what uh, Congresswoman Maxine Waters and I have been doing on the Financial Services Committee. It is the beginning process. We have a lot of work to do. And there's so many new avenues that are opening up with how we educate people as it relates to financial literacy. What are some of the alternative choices that we have to make individuals eligible for getting home loans and car loans and school loans? We're in the midst of COVID-19. So we have to think differently 
and we have to have those who are going to push the envelope for those who are marginalized. So that's what we're doing. At the top of my list also is a racial justice and equity policy chair through the Congressional Black Caucus with the financial service and with the financial services diversity and inclusion. We are building on what we've done in the last Congress, and that's holding people accountable, bringing them in, asking them how have they moved the needle? What does their C-suites look like? What does their employment look like? And it's not just hiring people. It's how do you change the culture away from the systemic racism that we have here now? And I think the racial justice and equity is going to be a part of it because it's about inclusion and equity. I really appreciate, Representative Betty, you talking about what the Biden uh, President Biden and his team have done. I've actually been sitting here, you know, for, for a while here, moderating events, kind of checking in a little bit here and and uh, saw that come out. It's I think, a very important thing to say, you know, that issue of racial equity is going to be part and parcel of everything they do. So it's a it's a it's a big it's it's a jump up slightly different direction. But I, I guess my other question to you is today, as we look at well, let me just tell you, John Hope Bryant just gave me an idea. Maybe it's already done. He said, you know, we can map the FICO scores uh, of different communities around the country, different states around the country, Mississippi, California, Oklahoma, wherever it may be, go in deeper in communities. I'm sure that FICO itself you know, knows what this looks like. What comes to me is whether or not, you know, I look at many of the problems as marketing problems. Is there a way to go in and begin talking to communities, these communities, and partnering with financial services firms in, in helping to instill an understanding of what goes into a FICO scores, what it goes into financial literacy, and also get feedback about what's missing that, that, that those institutions aren't reading or getting. I just, you know, I don't want to be naive, but I'm just wondering, is there any opportunity for that? Oh, I think partnerships are certainly a great opportunity. I think you have to have companies. I think you have to have financial institutions. Credit unions are doing a lot of that that you have to go in and do the education and training when that consumer comes in. But I think we have to start before that. I think we have to start when young folks are in school, before you can graduate from high school, you have to understand all of the qualities and things that have to be in your portfolio to have good credit or better yet, how to manage your money and how to be able to know what the ingredients are that's going to make your credit bad. By the mm. time you get to be an adult and you're going into some of those corporations, if you already have bad credit or you're on the verge of it, it takes you a longer period to undo it. I think we have to be very strategic about how we go into the communities, because certainly you and I know there are different ranges. If you just take a look at that three digit number that is so important to us, and if you look at it by race and ethnicity, if you look at it by income, then those ranges vary a lot from being at the low end of the 690 or 697 versus being at 730 in the credit range. And that's by race. Black Americans have the lowest score. So I think we need to look at how we look at those scores, how we provide those scores. I've written legislation on making sure that people get those scores, but partnerships are a great avenue in how we can look at things differently to be of help because we have systemic racism that has been going on for years, cultural racism that also plays a part into it and the disparities, the disparities in education. And the disparities when we even look at things alternatively of how someone values the same individual with the same credentials, but maybe a different education, that they look at that person and they make a decision that oftentimes is very unfair. Um, earlier in the show, I had Congressman McHenry on and I and I sort of said, you know, how would you change things up? And we got a little bit of talk about. Sometimes we, we are focused too much on individuals and not enough on small businesses. Those small businesses are sometimes individuals, but there needs to be a way to open up uh, financing and you know, find unique ways to do that. Um, and he wanted me to kind of raise that 
with, he said, his Democratic colleague, what would you like your Republican colleagues to think about or know about or map that they may not be hearing? What are their blind spots? Well, I think we have to, to look, what, look at what history has taught us. I think we have to start with the inequalities and the disparities that we have. We're in the midst of COVID-19 and one, I call it three pandemics. And one of those is what we're looking at with the economic turmoil. When you look at 41% of black owned businesses have been devastated by this, it's because we start out behind the eight ball. So I think mm. we have to look at education awareness. I think we have to be open and receptive that we need to root out all of those bad practices that we have had. There's so many biased and unbiased things that goes into the formula. So how about getting on board with diversity and inclusion? How about making sure that we create different or alternative avenues that we really discuss and we take a look at? Because there's so many things that's engaged, but we have to come to come together that we don't have this divide of how we look at things and that we don't make it partisan, that we sit down and we craft out how do we start changing? I like the idea of small businesses. We saw what we went through with PPP with small businesses. When those dollars went out for small business, we didn't have the opportunity to the first time to get it right. So many small businesses, African-American and minority businesses weren't included in the first round. Right. Then we were the ones that had to look at our MDIs and we had to look at our community development financial institutions and make sure that we crafted language and funds differently for those minority communities because right. black and brown communities, and this is a fact, are treated differently and there are disparities. So we could start there with businesses and you're right. Businesses are individuals and individuals make up some of the businesses. So if we just mm. take a look at saying, Let's start and look at people and communities right. and work towards moving the needle in a more creative and different way to be able to be helpful to bring some parity as we look at this. Well, Representative Beatty, the last time we talked, I don't know if you remember, we were talking about COVID, we were talking about racial disparities, how it was hitting differently. And, you know, I remember you saying in absolute clarity, we can't continue doing the same things we've been doing because it is unjust, unfair. It's not bringing the country together. I hear the same things from you today. Congratulations on your new role as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. It's always fun to talk to you. I hope you'll come back. Absolutely. I'd enjoy it. Now come back with a little more resolve after we get into this session, because we think having the president building back better and doing things like he's done with the executive orders this week, the DNI training now with federal contractors, he's rescinded that, that the former president had put a halt to. So I think we're having our doors open where we can come together more. Well, I look forward to seeing you again and hearing more about it. So thank you so much, as always. Uh, and, and thank you for your great tweets, for, you know, because I follow you on Twitter as well. So good to see you, my friend. Well, thank thank you. you. Thank you. My final guest on the program today is a fantastic, uh, fascinating household name, personal finance expert, Susie Orman. She's a number one time, or, sorry, number one, but of course she's number one. New York Times number one bestselling author, was contributing editor to O, the Oprah magazine for 16 years, hosted the award-winning Susie Orman show on CNBC for 13 years. Susie, great to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. I have name dropped you about six or seven times today about you know cash, about you know looking at the COVID era. I wanna thank you because I really enjoyed our pre call and I couldn't wait to, uh, to divulge some of our discussion. But let me ask you, as we think about this question of how do you open the aperture on, on financial inclusion in this country, what's top on your list? Is Susie there? Okay, are we in touch with Susie? All right, well, uh, I am going to try to get on with Susie here real quick and I will tell you, um, I had an incredible conversation with Susie Orman uh, the other day where we talked a little bit about the COVID era and, and whether or not there needs to be some pause in the way we grade people. I think that's up for other people to debate, but it's, I think, a legitimate question. We also talked a little bit about the fact that different parts of America have different financial patterns. They operate in different ways. I think that's part of what FICO is getting to. I'm sorry? 
Okay, good. I hope so. Susie Orman, are you a great? Susie, I just said really great things about you a moment ago and introduced you, but I wanted to say I've name dropped you about seven times during the show today uh, on some of the things that I just couldn't wait for you to get on uh, and raise some of these questions about how do we seriously move towards a more financially inclusive picture? Uh, some mm -hmm. of what's been talked about is looking at other data flows that we can look at. What's top on your list? Well, here's the problem, and in my opinion, everybody, in all the years that I've been doing this, you know, FICO never, in my opinion, has taken into consideration where is the money coming from to pay the bills. And it seems to me that we reward people for getting in debt versus rewarding people for paying in cash. So what do I mean by all that? What struck me during all the years of the Susie Orman show is that people would have a great FICO score, but as I would be going through their finances, they did not have one penny to their name. Hmm. How were they paying their credit cards? By payday loans, loans from their 401k plans, personal loans from their family, just so they could have a good FICO score. FICO never took that into consideration. Then I came across a whole group of people that paid for everything in cash. The unbanked, the underbanked, all of those people that didn't want to have a credit card, that wanted to pay in cash. And we were penalizing all of them because they did not have a FICO score. And they didn't have a FICO score because they didn't have a credit card. So they paid for their rent in cash. They paid for all their bills in cash but yet they were penalized for it. So I think the time has come seriously that we redo the entire scoring system, if you ask me. Because just because you're able to pay your bills on time, just because you're able to expand your credit limit and get more of a credit limit, so you're able to decrease your credit to debt limit ratio, which increases your FICO score, all of those things, in my opinion, don't make any sense anymore, especially today. Well, in a world, you know, I ask you, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I want to be careful about how to talk to Tash. I had a, you know, debate today, um, and I'm sort of happy that, you know, Andrew Jackson is going to re be replaced uh, on the $20 bill with Harriet Tubman, but that's a whole nother topic. But you raise these questions about cash versus credit, credit, and I'm just very aware of how digital everything has become. I mean, I know the world that you're talking about, about cash, exists. But I also know that the digital world has become bigger, that COVID, uh, for better or for worse, has shoved everyone in to a real digital life. You know, our fun is digital. Our dealing with our family and telling who people we love is digital. Our work is digital. And so I'm just wondering, I mean, so I'm hearing what you're saying about cash, but the other side of me is saying, you know, we're in a digital world more than we ever were before. So tell me where I'm wrong, as no, Rachel no, no, Maddow no, no, no. would say. <laughs> cash doesn't necessarily have to mean the green stuff. Doesn't uh. have to mean that. It can mean a prepaid card. It can mean a debit card, for instance. Hmm. There are many people that do have money in banks, but they right. don't want a credit card. They don't want to get in trouble. They're you know afraid of it for whatever hmm. reason. So let them play on their debit cards, on their prepaid debit cards. That should be able to be let you be your digital so, so self, let them do things and still be okay. So that debit card behavior, I mean, this is something I had raised several other times today. I told you I would. But in addition to looking at utility bill payments, rent payments, other dimensions, it does raise this thing that, that, that debit card behaviors in paying bills is also part of the footprint. So that's something that you would say add to the mix, right? I would absolutely say add that to the mix. You know, what's so funny is that we just got um, an, an example of somebody sending me in this card that they just got with their stimulus, you know, payment on it. And if you look at the back of the card that they got, because they don't really have a bank account, so mm. they were sent this card, the fees on the back of this card from our government is absolutely crazy, by the way. I'm just going to say that. But there are a lot of people, a lot of ways that we can improve the system big time, everybody. There has to be, because I can tell you the way that we're doing it right now is not a good example across the board. There are people that are penalized. You know that their car insurance premiums are higher because they don't pay and they don't have a credit card and they aren't paying 
it on time and things like that. Their direct TV bill is higher. They're even being penalized when they go to get a job because their job says, well, let me check your credit report. You don't have a credit report. So we have to find a different way to report to the credit reports that then tabulate an honest score that really dictates how people are treating their money. Susie, um, we, I don't know if you know John Hope Bryant of Operation Hope. We just had him on earlier, and he's an extraordinary guy, and he's been working with FICO, but he's been looking at this question of not, uh, I'm gonna get in trouble here, not philanthropy, not handouts, but how do you get gravity to go the right way by giving people both financial uh, uh, tools, financial ass, get, getting them to understand the importance of assets and aspiration and unlocking that. And he, had, and he said something that really struck me. He says, you can map the country in terms of FICO scores. You can go in every community, you know, guess what? The highest gun uh, violence in the nation are in districts with, you know, a 50 FICO score. You know, the ones that are at 700, you know, they're out shopping, not shooting each other. It's an interesting way. I had never thought of this before. And he says, we need to go into those communities. We need financial literacy. We need new tracks to look at how this and, and, and turn it around. And I'm just, you know, it's, it, it, reminded me a little bit of you. Do you think there's an opportunity to go into the places that have not been part of this picture and just make it an obsession of ours to turn that around? I think that's part of the conversation we need to have today. Listen, financial literacy, no matter where it happens to be, is something that is needed. Now, I find that people are totally financially illiterate in other aspects of their life, no matter what their FICO score happens to be. Mm. They don't know, should they have a Roth? Should they not have a Roth? Should they do? They don't know anything truthfully, the majority of Americans out there. And nobody, nobody in the entire United States talks to more people on the personal finance level than I do. But it's not just about financial literacy. It's not just about educating these people that they need this FICO score, they need this, they need that. They know they need it, but we won't give it to them unless they conform to what we want from them. Rather than having them conform to what we want from them, why don't we conform to what they need from us in order to establish themselves in really an economic, economic way that empowers them. You know, they feel, and this is true, that there is a highway into poverty and there is not even a sidewalk out. Because hmm. once you get in there, you now don't have the tools. I mean, really, Steve, look at what's just happened with the pandemic. And I myself called FICO twice and talked to heads of FICO and asked them, can you please freeze the FICO scores from February of last year? If you had a great FICO score before all of this happened, and now you've lost your job, you can't find another job, you're being evicted, all these things are happening to you, which will ruin and has ruined your FICO scores, even if you are doing everything like you're supposed to do it, and now you have a really low FICO score for no fault of your own, now you're going to be punished. Your car insurance premiums in many states, is, they're going to go up. You're not gonna be able to probably get hired because once an employer checks your credit report, oh my God, you're in the 500s versus the 760s before. So there's so many new ways that we have to look at things because of the pandemic, mm. because of people being out of job, because of what it's done to their FICO scores. We really have to look at this because we're hurting the majority of the people in the United States that really are on the brink of poverty. You know, I think just when, you know, uh, I really appreciate your candor, um, Susie, and it's so such an honor to talk to you. My husband's going to be super uh, thrilled that we connected. We'll have to do this again. But I want to, you know, ask one other question. You know, there's a, uh, someone I know. He was actually a guy who wrote a biography of Walt Disney. Uh, he was a screenwriter. He wrote a cover story in the Atlantic magazine. His name is Neil Gabler. And he basically confessed, um, as, as, as my friend Ray Suarez used to be on PBS, did recently that they're one of those people who if a $400 uh, uh, incident hit them, they're underwater. And we sometimes don't talk about that. Is it even many of those people who seemingly look successful 
have a financial fragility in their circumstances that are out there. And I guess, since you do talk to everyone, do we need to rethink our economic social contract? Do we have to rethink? Because we're talking about those that have not been part of it, but even those that are in it right now are, I just see more and more stories where that gap between what may be apparent and what may be real uh, for them financially is something we don't often talk about. And I want to talk about yeah, it. You know, most, most people out there are financial fakers. The cars they drive are financed or leased to the you know, companies they financed with. Their homes are financed up to the hilt with some mortgage lender. Their clothes they wear are financed on the credit cards from the department stores and other places like that. What you see is not what's real. There are very few people out there, believe it or not, that what they look like is also what they have. You know, I was with a doctor yesterday and this doctor has an office with four other doctors working for her and mm. all these people. And you would think that she has so much money and everything is going great. And we started to talk like I always do. And mm. I said, so what do you do with your money? And by the time the conversation was over, she started to cry. She's a 58 year old successful doctor. And she says, Susie, I'm putting my son through medical school. It's $150,000 a year. I promised him I would do that. I've mm. had to take a mortgage out of my home. I don't have any money. I just found out that the money that I was sending to this financial advisor has put me all into insurance products. And now I'm sitting here and I'm telling you, I don't have a retirement account. All I have is debt. And I feel so ashamed and I don't know what to do. You would look at her normally and go, wow, she's really a successful doctor. I <laughs> bet she's doing yeah. great. The more money I have found people make, the more they spend. The bigger house, they have. The fancier car, they have. They don't think about living right. below their means, but within their needs. So I'm telling you, we need a total financial revamp on every possible way. We need to open up the discussion of money, which is what I do right. on my podcast, the Women and Money podcast, and the Men Smart Enough to Listen, official title, by the way. Um, and that's where the truth mm. comes out. We have to stand in our truth, Steve. When we talk money, it's not what you see on CNBC or on Fox Business or on Bloomberg. It's really what's behind the scene when nobody can see what you really have going on, which yeah. I do. That's what we need to start looking at. Well, Susie Orman, uh, thank you so much. Uh, person who talks to more people about their financial situation than anyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. Take care and give your husband a kiss for me. <laughs> OK, great. Well, our goal today was to talk about every dimension of this question. And, you know, when we kind of look at this question of the American dream, how to build it, part of the question is how to get it healthy, how to get new tracks uh, in to do this right, listen to alternative ways to bring people into the financial picture and give people, you know, an, uh, a, a better read. If they're, if, they're, if, if they're living in a certain way and their bills, uh, whether from rent, from utilities and others, will give you that better picture, that is part of the question and part of the process. But we dealt with an awful lot today, and I want to thank all of our speakers. This brings us to the end of our program. A big thank you to FICO for its support and to all of you attendees for joining us for this, this discussion. For those of you who have missed any of the conversations, we'll have the video from all of this up on our website shortly. For those of you who can't get enough of our events, come back at 3.30 p.m. today, Eastern, uh, and for listening to America. We're going to go to every corner of the country that we can and get a fascinating look at what folks are, around this nation are expecting from the new administration. We'll be speaking with Colorado Governor Jared Polk the mayors of New Orleans and Española, New Mexico or Española, New Mexico, and many more. I'm Steve Clemens. Be well.